this is Speaking Freely, and we are going to talk. We're so fortunate to have the chance to talk today with Ilya Shapiro uh, about speaking freely, about issues on campuses uh, and otherwise, and more broadly, uh, his views about the state of free speech uh, uh, in the U.S. Uh, in light, though, of uh, your recent uh, adventures at Georgetown, uh, it's hard not to start uh, with that. Uh, so tell me if I get anything wrong. Uh, you were about to head the Constitution Center at Georgetown Law School. Uh, president Biden, as we will recall, had announced that he would be the first president to appoint a black woman uh, to the Supreme Court. And in a tweet that you wrote, you urged uh, him to appoint the chief judge of the United States Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia, uh, a man, as it happens, of Indian descent, uh, and observed that, uh, alas, uh, he would likely not do that and appoint a, quote, lesser black woman, unquote. Those words led to enormous controversy, I will say, since I'm the first person to have a chance to speak on this here, that I understood it to mean less qualified black woman than whoever he would appoint. But whatever I understood and whatever you meant, there was great contretemps uh, on campus. Uh, and otherwise, there was a four-month, I'm going to ask you about this, investigation of you of some sort. Um, and finally, a decision that since you were not an employee at the time, you had said whatever you said, that uh, the university in Georgetown had no basis for sanctioning you, but that you should be careful, uh, mind your lips, uh, to comply with uh, campus requirements thereafter. And that in response to that, you resigned, saying in substance, uh, I don't want this job if the price of it is that I'm supposed to be under constant surveillance uh, with respect to my speech. And so you are about to uh, uh, take a different position, uh, which we'll talk about in a moment. But first, did I get most of that right? I think you did. You did indeed. Um, four months to apply very clear law, the policies at issue, the harassment and discrimination policies, uh, and the free speech and expression policies, of course, all very short and clear, uh, to the facts, which was even shorter, uh, if less clear, perhaps, my tweets, uh, four months for a legal institution, after all, to, to, to conduct that investigation, at the end of which the high-pired lawyers at, uh, at Wilmer Hale, who were advising the university, someone looked at a calendar and, uh, and found, oh, he wasn't actually an employee, so none of this really matters, never mind. Um, a lot, of, a lot of stuff obviously going on there behind the scenes, but at the end of it all, after I reviewed the report from the Office of Inclusion, um, Diversity, Equity, and Affirmative Action that was investigating me, it became clear with advice of counsel and, and others, my wife, who's better counsel than, than anyone else, uh, that it was an untenable position and I, I could not fulfill the duties for which I had been hired. So there we were. So... Uh... What was the investigation? I mean, were, were there interrogations of you? Did they talk to people you knew? I mean, what, what did it amount to? I was interviewed about three weeks later um, and given the opportunity for about an hour and given the opportunity to make a written submission, which I did. Um, most of the questions were, what did you mean in the tweet? Um, tell me again the circumstances surrounding the tweet variations uh, on that. Uh, they also interviewed Randy Barnett, the professor who founded uh, and is the faculty director of the Center for the Constitution. Um, and they interviewed the dean, the associate dean of students, uh, a man by the name of Mitch Balin. Uh, and that's it, at least that's what I gather from the, from the report. 
Uh, and all of those interviews were conducted in, in February. And then they, they sat on it. And, uh, uh, you know, the cynical and you know, most likely conventional wisdom is that they were waiting for students to get off campus to announce my uh, reinstatement, such as it was. Um, but I have no idea what else they, they, they could have been investigating. Right. Were students uh, interviewed? If you know, uh, I, I don't. It, it did not say that in the report that I got. I did not get the report. There were, there were two simultaneous investigations. One was by the office, the diversity office I just named. The other was by HR, by Human Resources. And that report I was not given, uh, per Georgetown policy. But I have no indication that uh, that anybody besides myself, Randy, and the and the dean of students were interviewed. How long is the the document that they issued saying in substance, well, you weren't an employee then, so, uh, you know, no, no, no foul. Uh. Well, the problem was there was much more substance than that. The, the whole report was 10 pages. Oh. Uh, most of it was not, you know, making the point about my not being an employee. Most of it was saying how um, you know, various analysis leading to the conclusion that next time I said something similar uh, that similarly uh, caused someone to claim offense and that would constitute a um, hostile educational environment uh, subjecting me to discipline. Okay. Well, let's turn to what I really wanted to talk to you about, which is your views about how universities ought to address issues of this sort uh, where uh, certain language and surely certain language all would agree is racist in nature uh, what how should they try to draw lines what I mean as, as you look back on this whole personal episode what how, how should all this have worked out in in a better world right um, well, first of all, we need to recognize that Georgetown is a private institution, so the First Amendment does not apply directly to it. However, uh, like most institutions, there is some sort, most uh, 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 academic institutions, there is a speech and expression policy, and Georgetown's is actually quite good. It was the, the most recent version was adopted in 2017, and it's pretty short, and it's clear, uh, and it says in no uncertain terms that speech and expression uh, are protected and just because someone doesn't like what someone else is saying sh you know should not uh, cause them to to be construed to violate uh, that policy uh, there's exceptions for um, harassment incitement to violence the the uh, the first amendment style uh, exceptions to speech uh, to, to the to, to speech protections so uh, at Georgetown, uh, like many places, uh, it's not a problem uh, with what's written on paper or in pixels. Um, but the, 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 the proof is in the pudding. It's how it's applied, uh, which results very much in, as I wrote in my Wall Street Journal op-ed describing this, which was basically a, a summary of my four-page uh, resignation letter, that uh, those types of policies are very much pixel barriers if um, administrators aren't willing to apply and enforce them. And in Georgetown's case, I also detailed not only how the standards they were applying were subjective, you know, somebody claims, somebody, anybody <clears throat> claims offense. Um, you know, having, having the freedom to speech unless, unless someone claims offense is of course no freedom at all. That, that's what, what you and I would call a heckler's veto. Um, so that's a problem. But even beyond that, even with that kind of subjective standard, um, it's been applied uh, unevenly depending on which uh, political or, or other perspective you're coming from. And I gave examples of professors uh, who said much more incendiary and outrageous things uh, and were not investigated or suspended or disciplined, uh, which was the correct call. I'm not saying they should have been. I'm saying I should have been treated the same as one. In fact, one of these professors, uh, Heidi Feldman at the law school, uh, said all sorts of things against Republicans. And uh, the District of Columbia, where Georgetown is, of course, located, um, actually has political affiliation as one of its protected categories, uh, no less than race and sex and, and the other things that we're more, more used to. Um, so uh, subjective standard applied unevenly, 
uh, with essentially creating a sort of Damocles uh, over me and you know shedding, setting a, a, a setting a shot across the bow of, of all faculty and staff uh, going forward. But you asked what should have the administrators have done, and I'd just say they 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 should do what you know at the University of Chicago, my law school alma mater, and and all too few institutions have done when they've had similar instances of a professor or staff member accused of, of wrong speak, as it were, and that is to cite the speech and expression policy and say, we may not agree with what he said. In fact, we disagree. Uh, that's fine. Um, but uh, uh, it is fully protected by, by our speech policy. And, th and that's all, you know, when that happens, then student demonstrations go away. All of these letters calling for somebody's head goes away. The 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 climate uh, can the, the 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 campus climate is turned down uh, a few notches. So it's not a matter of, well, we can't do anything at this point. Uh, society is such the discourse in general is so toxic. It's uh, you know we administrators of educational institutions just throw up our hands. No, I refuse to accept that. I think they just need to show some spine and enforce the the what in most places uh, is uh, the the very good policies they already have. What about overtly racist statements by a professor, say? I mean, suppose, you know, some other you uh, were to have said in that tweet, uh, you know, uh, black people shouldn't be on the Supreme Court. Uh, what, yeah. what, if anything, I mean, that's First Amendment protected. But uh, what I'm asking and even sort of struggling with is what, what should we want the university to do in that sort of circumstance? Well, I mean, hard cases uh, make for bad law, certainly. Um, and it would be rare for someone, you know, who's been at a university for a long time or, you know, has just been hired as I was after, after a, you know, a decade, couple of decade long career. And out of the blue, um, all of a sudden they're, you know, as what I was accused of doing, you know, the, 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 the clan robe slip and you can see who the, who the person actually is. I mean, that's, it's hard to imagine that kind of circumstance happening. You know, certain other things have happened, you know, the, after, after 9-11 uh, comments by, by certain professors or uh, even these things that I quoted, uh, these tweets that I quoted in, in my letter, you know, difficult uh, sorts of things, but less politically incorrect because coming from the left rather than the right. Um, you know, I... I You'd want to not hire those kinds of people in the first place. Hopefully, you know the, the vetting takes care of that. Um, uh, but in the end, it's the marketplace of ideas, and certainly, at a, a, you know, tenure protections come in. Uh, that wasn't an issue in, in my case because the free speech pr policy comes in, uh, covers re regardless of whether someone is is tenured or not. Um, and uh, you know, students uh, wouldn't be taking those classes, presumably. Uh, if the person actually was a racist and not just kind of subject to to a fake outrage mob, um, you know, I, I think there's there's things that would that would naturally happen. But the thing is, we we we're asking these questions because uh, as hypotheticals, because in effect, the demand for racism uh, outstrips the supply in this context where people are trying to be thought police. Talk to me a little more broadly now. What, I mean, what, what do you see as going on on American campuses with respect to uh, free speech, controversial speech, and the like uh, on campus being allowed, disallowed, frowned on, discouraged? Where, where are we as a society now in that area? I want to be clear that I'm not making the decades-old charge that universities, colleges, law schools are too left-wing. You know, that's always been the case. You know, I graduated law school almost 20 years ago. I graduated college almost 25 years ago. I don't think the ratio of progressive to moderate to conservatives on faculties or among students has really changed in that time. What has changed is administrators placating and kowtowing to a more radical, um, uh, left-wing ideological rigidity, whether you call it woke, whether you know whatever you want to call it, um, the Overton window, the 
the permissible range of policy views or even subjects for discussion in so-called civilized society or on campus uh, has shifted and narrowed. And um, part of this comes from administrators, part of it comes from self-censorship and, and things in, in student bodies. Um, and those trends do reflect certain, certain trends in uh, elite uh, America. Uh, in certain respects, um, but I, th I think, you know, Alan Bloom wrote uh, The Closing of the American Mind nearly 40 years ago, uh, but I think we do have uh, a different uh, iteration and a different uh, way of that uh, exact dynamic going on. I'm always struck by this, this topic, uh, in part because when I was in college, in the sort of, I don't know, the silent cold whatever generation the 1950s there was almost no free speech on campus i mean I, I went to cornell i arrived the first thing they give you is an id card which basically says carry this with you at all time and if you're not you're out of here uh, i mean <laughs> there were standards then you know uh, uh but uh the the conflict on campus sometimes about what speech is allowed and sometimes about what speech is harmful even if it is allowed uh, is not a new one but it, it does seem to be ramped up more now uh, do you think so i mean is is this area yeah, i think part of this i think part of this is that uh as American society has secularized, there's still a craving for some deeper fundamental, you know, faiths. Um, and uh, politics has has filled that gap. And so, um, so there's a loss of grace, in a sense, to, to borrow the religious terminology, a willingness to forgive a, a misstep or a slip up. Uh, in articulation, say, as well as uh, a refusal to see one's political or ideological opponents as merely wrong. Instead, they're evil, because after all, if politics is religion, then um, you know having the wrong political views is sacrilege, and, and why would we want to give a platform to heretics? So, you know, I don't want to overstate the case, but I think there's there's some of that dynamic going on. Do you, do you view that as being true left and right, or, or are you, you really focusing on the on the left? On on campuses, it's certainly the left. It's you know wherever there's a dominant enough uh, you know majority, uh, and then kind of a, a radical vanguard uh, to uh, you know a critical mass of that to, to set the standard, and then kind of a. Uh, you know, it's, it's where the weight of, of opinion might be in broader society. You know, there, there's political correctness of the right, certainly. Um, you know, the the MAGA crowd attacking uh, uh, never Trumpers or just you know regular Republicans as rhinos, um, and, and other things like that. There are certainly illiberal trends uh, from from both sides, but if we're talking academia, then that's unquestionably just the left. What sort of comments? Uh, tweets, letters, if anybody writes letters? What, what sort of communications did you receive as a result of the controversy about what you said and what they should do or not do about it? Um, well, first of all, I don't think this would have been that big of a controversy had it not been for uh, a couple of prominent reporters and other, you know, what are called uh, blue check marks uh, on verified you know, uh, members with large followings on Twitter who were amplifying, to, took screen captures of my tweets after I deleted them and amplified them to, you know, to get me fired. Um, what kind of response I got? Well, quickly I learned, and this is good Twitter practice, to uh, uh, remove notifications from people who don't follow you. That makes you a lot for a, a much saner, uh, healthier Twitter experience. Also, don't doom scroll late at night in your hotel room. That's what got me in trouble. Um, I know, you know if I was, hadn't been on the road, I wouldn't have been doing that. Uh, but anyway, uh, 
I got some 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 pretty vile things uh, on Twitter, some untrue things. Uh, I got some, you know, this is unfortunately nothing new. Some emails with, you know, uh, death uh, unspecific death threats. I guess you'd call them, or just you know, all caps, expletive laden screeds. Um, you know, spam filters filter some of that out, but I, I got some of those. But um, what I was really heartened and gratified to receive was an outpouring of support from friends and allies, some of whom uh, I hadn't talked to in, you know, over a decade, some of whom I'd never met before, but uh, who wanted to reach out and express support, some of whom took public stands in my support, you know, celebrities or semi-celebrities in, in various industries, some of whom back channeled to the dean or organized letters uh, in my support. Um, you know, I, I didn't. I didn't intend my career transition to go this way, of course, and I didn't intend to be a uh, you know, poster boy for cancel culture or anything like that. But um, I, I really, you really get to know who your friends are, even though I never really uh, would have wanted to learn this way. Um, but I, I, I did learn how many people, both um, you know, limited public figures, as it were, and just friends and, and private citizens who reached out in various ways, including in actual physical letters, Floyd. Um, so that's not completely dead to, to, uh, to express support. How about uh, civil liberties organizations or the like? Uh, David Cole, who's the legal director of the ACLU and on faculty at Georgetown Law, uh, wrote a piece saying I shouldn't be fired. And then when I was reinstated, he, he you know, wrote a piece saying that was the right call. So I'll, I'll give him credit, even though the ACLU has really become just another progressive activist group rather than um, you know, purely for civil liberties, which is why FIRE, uh, the Foundation for Individual Rights and now an expression, used to be Foundation for Individual Rights and Education, but they rebranded just last week, as, as you know, uh, and are now expanding to, to battle the, the shibboleths and the illiberalism on both the left and the right with respect to speech. And I owe them a huge debt. Uh, they provided um, support in terms of public relations, uh, crisis management in the initial days. They funded my lawyer uh, as part of their academic legal, uh, academic freedom legal defense fund. I told Greg Lukianoff, the president of FIRE, that I hope to now become one of his biggest fundraisers. I think it's an absolutely essential organization that um, has filled the gap and more from what the, the ACLU has, has largely left. Um, my own Cato Institute, where I spent nearly 15 years, uh, was one of the disappointments. They were completely uh, silent. I, of course, got notes from, from friends and, and other individuals, but institutionally there was, there was nothing that, that went up. Um, I think those are, the, those are the organizations that I think um, most come to did, mind. Did David... Uh... Uh, John, Malcolm at the, John Malcolm at the Heritage Foundation was, was outstanding. Um, you know, various, various individuals, obviously, who I've, who I've worked with in, in my capacity as a public interest uh, lawyer and commentator, uh, certainly uh, both publicly and privately uh, came out. And uh, you mentioned David Cole. Was he uh, speaking? I mean, did the ACLU, through David, support you, or was this David sort of more, more personally? If if there's a difference, um, uh, well, 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 I mean, when he published his op-eds, he was identified yeah, as the ACLU's yeah. legal director. I don't, I don't think the ACLU put out any corporate statements. Right, right, right. So, what's next for you? you you're you're going to huh. run the Manhattan Institute. Tell us about the, uh, tell us yeah. about that and what you're going to do there. Yeah, I had a surreal few days. So it was ten days ago now, two Thursdays ago, that I was reinstated, and I celebrated that uh, uh, technical victory in the pages of the Wall Street Journal. Then four days later, uh, I wrote my, uh, my departure memo also in the Wall Street Journal. And then the next night, uh, I announced my move to the Manhattan Institute to be its director of constitutional studies uh, on Tucker Carlson, Carlson's program on, on Fox News. So most people don't get to uh, make their professional uh, notices quite that way. But yes, I'm delighted to be joining my longtime friends at, uh, at Manhattan Institute. I'm not moving to New York, although my wife is happy that we'll now have a greater excuse to visit Broadway shows and, and such. Um, but I'll, I'll be staying in, in Northern Virginia and... and uh, 
broadening Manhattan's scope. They never had a constitutional director. You know, they focused on civil litigation and uh, regulatory affairs, mostly as they concern the financial industry, understandably being in New York as well as criminal justice. But uh, so I hope to support the, my colleagues there, also build out an amicus brief program as I did at Cato and continue to be in the public arena uh, defending free speech. Certainly, I now have this unplanned so-called lived experience, uh, but also, you know, the stuff that I've been doing on uh, you know scope of federal power, um, uh, you know, Second Amendment, uh, uh, equal protection, Fourteenth Amendment protections for various uh, various rights. So I will continue to be involved in various ways and taking advantage of the this platform that I've that I've been given uh, to to speak out on on all these issues that I've long cared about. Are are, are you uh, were you a practicing lawyer? Well, I was at the Cato Institute, and I filed amicus briefs. Right, that was right. the uh, the extent of, of my my very practice. high level, indeed. Uh, uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, no, it's... yeah, it's been it's been more than well. I, I have done a little bit of legal consulting on the side, <laughs> um, especially during this this period of uh, of purgatory when I was on when I was on administrative leave from Georgetown. But uh, uh, really, you know, it's been more than fifteen years since I was in big law billing hours. Expanding our universe from campuses to the country. You're a prominent uh, speaker, sp spokesperson for your views and the like. Uh, how stands the First Amendment in your view these days? If we're looking at the state of the law and jurisprudence and the Supreme Court really well, really well. I mean, this, I think one of the one of the few areas of near unanimity on the Supreme Court is in broad protections for speech and expression. Now, that breaks down on campaign finance, say, to the more familiar ideological lines. But other than that, legally speaking, we're in we're in pretty good shape uh, where you know, the challenge of our time is that um, we're back to the rise of kind of third spaces, what used to be called. So neither purely private nor public, uh, but what, you know, 100 years ago would have been, um, you know, public or private spaces affected with the public interest or something like that. And the debate over uh, social media, the debate over, uh, you know, large corporations having a lot of power and, and, and really uh, running the um, agenda with respect to how we think about the freedom of speech and hate speech and, and academia as well, for that, for that matter. So it's not uh, uh, an easy uh, way to look at it in terms of uh, state action versus private action. Uh, it is, I mean, as a matter of law, it, it, it may well be, but in terms of the health of yeah. um, civil discourse and free discourse in society, uh, we're facing that kind of challenge. Have we, have we moved forward, do you think, in terms of discussion of public affairs and the like uh, since the you know, the days of Huntley and Brinkley and Walter Cronkite and three networks. I mean, are we, are we better off as a society uh, that we have what everyone celebrated at the beginning of the arrival of this low-cost, no-cost, extraordinary means of communication that never existed before in the history of mankind, but... You know, sometimes I wonder, sometimes, you know, pejoratively, but, but how, how do you think we are coping with the development of new technology which makes it possible for everybody, you know, to have a say, but with more uh, hostile nasty, destructive speech more prevalent and more public than maybe ever before? Well, it's easier to speak for, for everybody, which is good. Um, you don't have the gatekeepers, as you said, the three networks plus, you know, few national newspapers, you know, had more local and regional ones. So that was, you know, different than, than it is now. That's all been hollowed out. But you, of course, do have unlimited space to publish online. Uh, you know, you're not restricted to the, the, the physical column inches in the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. 
uh, those organizations and much smaller ones have you know infinite uh, publication space. Uh, not to mention personal blogs and and all the rest of it. Now, Twitter, I think, is a net negative for our discourse, uh, just because the nature of the medium encourages hot takes and snark and snitch tagging and all these weird words that nobody would have understood, you know, a decade ago. Uh, but that, uh, you know, my my episode, I think, uh, uh, exemplifies one corner of, um, you know, the the kids these days aren't even on. You know, Twitter or Facebook, they're all about TikTok sure. and, I guess, uh, uh, creative dance to express your, your speech. Uh, I don't know what really what to think about that. Um, so, you know, on net, obviously, the Internet revolution, the technology revolution, I think, has, has made all our lives better off, including in the realm of public discourse. But certain corners of it um, are, you know, uh, create new sorts of challenges. Right. Well, yeah, thank you so much. Thanks for coming on to talk with us. Uh, I wish you well in your new position. Uh, I hope not to read about you on page one of some newspaper in the next well, few months. Well, yes, I, I, I hope not to, to go back to writing for the Wall Street Journal something other than autobiography. Okay, thanks very much.